No, he's amazing. Let's have a big round of applause. Big, warm round of applause for the amazing, the sensational Ian Weir. Thanks, Louis. Uh, I, I can't top that. I may just sit down now and have a listen to it. <laughs> Night has fallen as the devil emerges from his lodgings in Mayfair, lingers for a moment in the baleful sputter of a gas lamp, and then limps away through the London fog towards Regent Street. He has been awake since late afternoon, or rather, he has been awake all along, for the devil does not sleep. Instead, he reclines for periods of malevolent immobility, in which he broods upon ancient hatreds and marshals his energies for reprisal. At such times, his eyes glow crimson with the fires within, and wisps of smoke issue from the neck of his shirt, causing whosoever might be lying alongside him, such as an actress, or a half-guinea whore from Mother Clatterbalic, or just the crumpled ruination of a flower girl, to utter exclamations agonizing to our savior and leap to her feet, clutching her smock in consternation. Afterwards, he sits before the mirror with his pencils and his paints, preparing himself. This may take an hour and more, for the devil is ancient and lined and vain as a fading tragedian. People, will you put your hands together and give a big, warm welcome for the incendiary Kelvin Wharton. I'm going to start with this. It's my newest poem. It's called Meadowlark. Whenever I mention Saskatchewan, Meadowlark interrupts with a song so magnificent it can only be sung where geography relaxes into grasslands and tabletop horizon, while luminous sky sweeps away the pitiful small concerns we humans carry around with us. When Meadowlark mentions Saskatchewan, the rest of us stop and pay attention, feel the muscles in our shoulders loosen and our mouths open slightly as if we were about to share the song ourselves. And when Saskatchewan mentions Meadowlark, the breeze falters and daylight becomes a verb, conjuring time stopped with only music alive and moving through this world. Will you please give it up for the amazing Trevor Carolyn, everyone! Big round of applause for Trevor Carolyn as he comes to the stage! Because I hear it is due west, my own hometown. Um, this is from my very first book in a previous incarnation back in the Napoleonic age. Uh, it's the last poem in the book. From, it's called Closing the Circle, uh, and this one's just called New Westminster. You can imagine just looking at the river from about 100 yards from here up the hill, 50 yards from here up the hill. Night sounds drift up from the river, exquisite screech of train rails grinding steel on cold, raw steel slowly up the line to Port Moody. Tug whistles ball counterpoint off Brownsville beneath the Teller Bridge, chugging and chugging. Burglar alarms ring and ring back of warehouse row. Gulls scream mad all night in feeding orgies. Hooligans arc lit when we still had hooligans by milliard sodium lamps, white ghosts hovering that veer in the false light, iridescent swoop, the spawn run, cry on starts of wind blown up from the delta, muscle cars rev cobbled hilly streets, swarthy glistening sea lions bark and bark for love in moonlight, hometown boy. for inviting me this afternoon uh, with a poem from uh, my book, Parallel Lines. This is a little one. Nitobi Water Lily. In this garden of undulations, I want to smooth the curve of lawn the way I move my hand over the rise of your hip and listen to trees breathe reflections into the pond to surface like shot silk. At the silent end of a long summer day, I wish to wax high on the arch of this bridge, let night come down on my pale body, afloat, a water lily opened under a naked moon.
been penning a lot of poetry, and I gotta say, it's quite amazing. Give it up for the amazing Dennis E. Bowen, everybody! Thanks, Reese, and thanks uh, for the Federation for having me here, uh, inviting me to uh, be in such suspicious company. It's wonderful. Um, I congratulate them actually on this event, uh, and, like as a, as a consciousness and, and uh, profile raising uh, uh, event. It's, it, I think it's working out uh, just, just great. Dramatic stars in our own fight scene. The legend of Tough went town wide. And we all slugged away, with or without invitation. Then our war vet teacher, principal, and grueling historian appeared one day, stepping livid. Grabbed two boys punching, instructed the punchy to follow. Marched the coterie into a secret, unseen, mysterious office where, for an hour, low talking was not quite heard. Then to our desks came loudness, piteous pleading, impact. Two for each hand. The first eight near lost amid shriek. The last four unaccompanied. Audible leather on hand being the only indication that punishment continued, unabated by our seized breath, harrowed psyches straining for sufficient ground to withstand the aural, the tactile, and near olfactory aspects of our witnessing. Which house. Will you please welcome to the stage the sultry Santana, sultry Santana herself, <laughs> Sylvia Taylor. Big round of applause, everybody, as Woo! Sylvia comes to the stage. Way too many adjectives. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I know. Uh, it's my honor to share with you um, a piece from my upcoming literary memoir, The Fisher Queen. There's nothing I wouldn't do. I would turn myself inside out to prove I could do it. Anything. I was a fierce lioness, padding around my 39-foot territory. Bring it on, I snarled. Think I'm too girly? Bring it on. Think I'm too little? Bring it on. Think I'm too citified? Bring it on. I could sleep less, eat less, learn faster, make less mistakes, and be more cheerful than any deckhand in this fleet. And when he told me not to, because it was too heavy or too dangerous, I'd just wait till he was napping or distracted, and I'd do it anyway, and find a better way to do it. It was a rare and glorious day of early smooth seas, caressing breeze, and benign sun, and all the world rejoiced. At least this little part of it did. Those were the days so full of God's grace when Gaia was her most loving and tender and you couldn't imagine being anywhere or doing anything else. There'd been nothing on the lines for two pulls and there wasn't another boat for miles we'd scrubbed and organized, repaired and patched, tied more gear and checked the glistening beauties lined up in their chilly beds in the hold like dollars in the till, their gutted bellies chubby with crushed ice. I was secretly thrilled when Paul announced he was hitting the bunk for a nap. The autopilot was working for once, and all I had to do was keep an eye on things. Don't get yourself into trouble, he said, reminding me he wouldn't hear me through the sleep and the engines thrumming. We were trolling our way back to Bull Harbor, and that would take hours. I was so excited it was hard to act nonchalant. I felt like a kid left at home alone, and I was going to do everything alone. I was going to catch a salmon prince. 